It's good to see uh, you guys here today. Thank you so much. I know um, policy might not be the most exciting thing, but uh, I think hopefully this will, will be of interest to you. So just a quick introduction. Uh, I, as you can see, there are two speakers, but there's only one today, um, flight issue. Um, but uh, rest assured, I'll try my best to do a great uh, Hunter impression today. So a quick introduction. Um, I am... There we go. Yeah, uh, I am Eugene, and uh, I'm representing the uh, Government Technology Agency of Singapore, which is uh, our main uh, government digitization and um, uh, technology agency where we develop applications for the uh, Singaporean public. We also uh, maintain a lot of our IT infrastructure, as well as deliver digital services for uh, the Singapore. And uh, I'm part of the Open and Government uh, Products team, which is actually a division a department within GovTech, uh, where we kind of work on a more experimental nature, and we try to bring in new practices uh, for developers to the government, and as well as GovTech. So, um, Hunter uh, is the distinguished engineer at, at Government Technology Agency, and he basically kind of looks at all of our technologies, tries to bring us uh, to the next stage of uh, how we do uh, development and software and government in Singapore. Uh, myself, I am a lead security engineer, so I run the security program at Open and Government Products, responsible for the security, application security, organization security, and um, I also have a second job. Uh, no, I, I mean at night, you know, I do a lot of security research. Uh, I like to do white hat hacking, and that kind of gives me the other angle in security today. So what we'll be talking about for today is how we transform IT policy in the Singapore government. And uh, the previous talk was actually pretty decent. It was also about uh, security policy and how we apply security policy and bring uh, developers to uh, uh, contributing to legislation and security policy. But I'm kind of going to give you the other angle today where I'm talking about how uh, do we bring policymakers to adopt more developer-centric uh, approaches, workflows, as well as content. And I'll just share with you our journey in digitizing that for the Singapore government. So let's start with some first principles of modernizing IT policy for the Singapore government. I think many of you may have encountered this before, where you, um, you know, there is a certification you want, right, or there's an audit coming up, and you just kind of like rush around and make sure all the controls are in compliance. And once the audit is over, you can kind of, whew, you know, kind of forget about everything else, right? I've, I've heard some really bad horror stories uh, about people just doing things for the sake of compliance, and then the road is, um, becomes like that. So I think over time, um, one of the evolutions we see in the industry is continuous compliance, right? There are many tools out there that will help you with that. There's CSPM, um, there are stuff like dependency track, and what these tools do is that it's not just a annual audit that checks if you're compliant to certain controls. You do have automated checks that maybe check your cloud environment, they may check your on-premises environment. Um, basically, configuration checks that ensure and tell you how secure you are um, at any one point in time, right? It could be running daily, it could be running almost hourly, and this gives you a better picture of a organization's security at that point in time. But some of you are smiling at me right now, and I think we're all pretty, pretty um, kind of familiar with the fact that just because we are compliant to a certain sta standards does not necessarily equate to security, right? Just because you check that box, just because you, I don't know, you have a incident management plan documented really nicely somewhere in a Word document, doesn't actually mean that when an incident happens, you're actually gonna stick to it, or anyone knows what it's gonna do. Um, may just get a dust and not actually improve your security. And that's some of the thinking that uh, kind of brought us to relook how we did uh, security policy, IT policy, in the Singapore government, and how we can actually improve the way that we do things there. So I think one of the challenges, um, and I, I thought actually the previous talk was really good, uh, was about what are the challenges in typical IT policy, security policy, security legislation? Well, first of all, um, it's mostly closed source, right? There are Word documents, emails, spreadsheets, so many spreadsheets, where policy developers are talking to each other and thinking about what is the next step, what is the new draft of security policy. Um, and it's not open to anyone, right? There's no recorded discussions, um, there are no email threads um, that are open you know, to the public, and this makes it very hard for us to iterate uh, properly where we kind of think, hey, there's this security control that doesn't really make any sense. How did they arrive at the decision? Who do I get blame for this bad policy? Um, and that's not available. 
The second challenge is um, really about um, internal only. So some of these controls that we implemented within the Singapore government were not public. They were not available to the industry. And it kind of led to this really weird situation where we were talking to vendors, software vendors being, hey, we would like you to build a system for us, and it has to be compliant. And they're like, OK, great. Yeah, what do we comply to? And it's like, we can't tell you. Uh, and it's really weird, right? But uh, it did happen for a while. It's one of those things that happen in policy where weird stuff happens for the longest time. Everyone complains about it, but no one fixes it. Um, as an engineer, that's really hard to grasp, but it happens in government. Um, and the third is really slow releases, because the way policy, traditional policy development is done is that people send emails, they request for a pre-meeting, they go for a pre-meeting, and then they request for a meeting. And then finally at the meeting, they approve it to go up to the next meeting, right? And so there's a lot of synchronous, you know, you know in-person policy development, where there's a lot of convincing a lot of stakeholders, and that means that things are slow. And we see that the pace of updates um, goes down to maybe annually at best, right? And for those of you who are very, you know, big about delivery, Dora metrics, you know, this is frustrating. So those are the problems. And so what we were kind of empowered to do and tasked to do, right, was how can we bring software development principles, policies, open source approaches to policy development in the government, particularly technology policy. And this started with something called the uh, cloud-first architecture in open government products, um, where we kind of pointed at a few engineers to be like, hey, you write the security controls and policy now. Right? And they did it like engineers do. They did use Git. They use Markdown. They build tools. Uh, they use uh, stuff like internal developer portals, like Backstage, which is an open source software. And we thought it worked pretty well. Um, it was pretty interesting. Um, it started to make a bit more sense. Um, some of you, uh, I saw some Google people. Uh, one of the things that Google has done is something called the minimum viable secure product uh, set of standards, where they also kind of got engineers to write their own set of security controls. And we thought that was actually a pretty good approach, because the stuff that comes out are things that engineers actually agree with, make sense to them, and they also understand what they have to do. As this has expanded within the uh, Singapore government uh, last year, we started to move it and expand it into actual policy that would apply beyond just uh, open government products to the rest of government. And this started with a beta, where we did some standardization. We added some automation tools to automatically check for uh, some of these controls. And finally, we managed to launch this year. And so really, one of the biggest changes that we did was bringing an engineering mindset to security controls. Um, the first was that we developed it in Git. right? So uh, merge requests, issues, um, all of these were tracked in the open. right? And so anyone who kind of disagreed with a particular security control that was introduced into our policy, our compliance frameworks, could actually just look in the Git history and be like, hey, this guy did that. And in this issue or pull request, they um, had this reasoning. The second is interoperability, and I'll talk a little bit, deep dive into that a bit more, about how we adopted a standard called the uh, OSCAL, um, where it uh, basically allows you to express security controls in JSON, right? and this is actually machine readable, and used by many systems nowadays, it's starting to grow in the governance, risk, and compliance GRC space. And a third is that we brought in our engineering community. So we brought in engineers to you know, talk about development standards. We brought in security folks to talk about security testing standards. And I know it sounds obvious, but that really improved um, the kind of controls that we have in our standards in the government. And not only the engineering mindset, but we also changed the way we thought about policy. Most of the time, policy is very um, compliance first. It's very regulation. You know, you do this, I tell you this, and do that. But we started to bring a bit more of a product-oriented mindset, where we think about policy as a product. How are users using this policy? Are they just checking a box and kind of calling it a day? Um, do they understand what the control is? And a lot of it was driven by data, because when we move towards a machine-readable format and compliance checking, we now know what percentage of the government, for example, systems are able to comply with this standard, right? And by highlighting gaps in compliance or deviations or requests, we can now tell, for example, maybe this control isn't written that well, right? Maybe they kind of complain about it, grumble about it, um, and it's not being surfaced to us, but we can tell that it's not actually being implemented across the government. So maybe we need to relook that control or drop that control. 
Um, the third thing is really just, again, more collaboration. And how we rolled out policy previously was kind of, you know, we circulate this uh, set of slides or spreadsheets or Word documents, and then everyone comments, and then we kind of go back and forth, and then we release this like, it's done. Nowadays, we go with uh, versioning, we do iteration, we do beta tests, um, where anyone can sign up, give comments, and we iterate in an agile fashion, right? I know agile is very abused um, in many organizations these days, but uh, I think it's just somewhat more agile than how it was done before. So basically, we don't see policy as a monolithic um, product that is released once every few years, right? Now we release in sprints, we also have um, beta cycles that allow us to gather feedback and release you know, with proper change logs versioning and updates so that everyone can kind of know the difference whenever we push out something new. Okay, so I talked a lot about the first principle, so I think that is kind of makes sense. Let's talk about how we actually did it. How do we implement a more DevOps developer first approach to policy within government? Well, I mentioned Oscal earlier, and um, Oscal is this uh, kind of way they like to describe by itself. It's developed by the U.S. National Institutes of Standards. It's kind of like a cyber machine readable Esperanto that enables blah 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 blah. Right. So that's a lot of words. Um, <laughs> so let's just kind of like look at what it means. Right. So it's the Open Security Controls Assessment Language developed by the U.S. National Institutes of Standards, and it's a format for expressing security controls and compliance. It can be expressed in, it's kind of a schema, so you can express in JSON, XML, um, and, and it kind of looks like this, right? So you would see, for example, this is a control describing how you should implement content security policy, which is a set of HTTP headers that a website has to return, right, to make it somewhat more secure, mitigate cross-site scripting attacks. Um, it comes with two parts. There is a statement that tells you exactly what you need to do. And then there's a second part, which is the guidance, which says, you know, you may want to do it this way or that way. Um, here's some additional information. It also allows you to link to other uh, standards. So in this case, for example, our control link to Google's uh, minimum viable secure product uh, standard. It also linked to one of our older standards within the government so that agencies that were previously compliant to this standard or control would know that they are also compliant with this control. And we also finally added our own um, innovation where we had a uh, additional risk statement um, because what we're trying to do is that we're trying to empower agencies and system owners to decide on which controls they want to implement. And so by having that risk statement available, they can now kind of make the call about whether this makes sense to implement the system or not. Will this introduce a new risk to the system? Um, and this is kind of a change in the way that we talked about policy and how we roll out policy because previously we kind of said, do these 100 controls, and that's all you need to do. Um, and that was kind of a compliance-first approach to policy. And now we're kind of saying, let's move towards a more risk-based approach to security. Uh, here's maybe 50 uh, recommended controls, and you can kind of put together like Lego blocks which controls you want to implement for your system. And to help you along, here's some risk statements, right? If you do this control, you probably will help to mitigate this security risk. Um, it's less likely that they will attack you this way. And if you don't do this control, then you may open up this gap. But at the same time, you can also select another control that may patch that gap for you. So it's a very big mindset shift where we're no longer giving a top-down set of controls that everyone has to comply with and maybe uh, deviate from and request a waiver for, um, but rather we're trying to empower them to select the controls that make sense to them. So let's break down the OSCAL uh, format a bit. And this is not really a presentation about OSCAL, but I think it's important for us to understand what it looks like um, and means so that uh, you understand how we rolled it out across government. The first is that we have a catalog of controls. So this is a set of controls, um, you know, just indexed and numbered, um, that governs all parts of security. Um, the US uh, SP-853 has 1,200 controls. Um, we have about 118, so maybe we'll get there someday or not. Um, and from this set of controls, you can assign profiles to them. So for example, there's this set of, maybe there's this critical control that makes sense that every system system should implement, right? And that's what we put in the baseline profile. But maybe there's a more advanced control that maybe only medium risk or higher risk systems uh, might want to consider. That's when we kind of put a medium impact or high impact profile to them. So think of it as like a tag that we apply to a control. 
And finally, the most important is the uh, system security plan. So every single system that is kind of governed by this program uh, has a system security plan that describes how that system is implemented, uh, which controls they are going to implement, and which components of that systems implement that control. And finally, very importantly, who is responsible for implementing that control. So I think one big theme from the talks today that you see is S-bombs, they mentioned everywhere, right? Think of this as almost like an S-bomb for security controls, uh, compliance, and, and that makes it a lot easier, but also a lot more automatable uh, in an ideal world, of course. And that brings us to the uh, third part, which is really how do we automate these checks? And one of this is the assessment plan, which takes a system security plan and tells you for each control that this system says that they have implemented, how will it be assessed? Is it done manually? Is it done through a file upload of an incident management plan, for example? Is it done using an automated configuration check? Um, and this will be fed into our um, automated checks, compliance systems that we have built, and output an assessment result. So what you see is that from the end to end, um, we no longer kind of have a weird mapping exercise where they look at a set of controls and they try to figure out how a system is in compliance with it. But it's now encoded in the system security plan. Um, it allows a automated check tool to uh, verify that these checks are in compliance. Of course, this is very much in the ideal world. A lot of the controls we have, for example, are process controls um, that is very much still part of uh, cybersecurity standards today. But what this means is that we start optimizing for automation. The set of controls that we want to implement in a system security plan um, that we mandate people to implement are slowly, gradually moving towards more automatable, checkable controls. And this makes it more effective for our developers to develop a secure system um, because these you know, make more sense eventually. So, one of the things um, I found interesting um, was that it did evolve the way that we develop security controls within the government. The first is really the fact that we adopted Git, right? So now all our controls are in JSON, it's on a repository somewhere. We have also open sourced it, so we can, I'll have the link for you later on. Um, and the way that we contribute now is using Git workflows, right? We have issues, we have pull requests, merge requests, um, and it allows us to get blame when something goes wrong and figure out who wrote that control, right? Um, we've really, you know, it's actually, been quite a, an interesting journey because we inner sourced it within our government. So we, we do have our own uh, a Git repository uh, platform. Um, and now we see developers emerging from the woodwork because this is exactly where they commit the code and they need to comply with a certain control. They're not happy with it. They create an issue or they create their own merge request to modify that control. And that feeds to the contributing section, right? Because we have really changed the way that we have done um, the development and deployment of security policies. As I mentioned previously, it was kind of like Word document, spreadsheet hell, right? People would send emails back and forth and argue, and eventually something would come out. But now it's done all in a Git repository. And this allows us to do crowdsource commits on merge request branches. Um, it allows us to have code owners. So there may be a group of controls that we put under the responsibility of the cybersecurity department, uh, for example. And they maybe are experts in offensive security. So they are now the code owners of the policies that govern security testing, such as penetration testing. And if someone wants to make a change to it, we automatically tag the experts to review that merge request and approve it if they think it makes sense, right? So now it's far more transparent, a lot more distributed, and it's not, you know, in, if you forget to leave someone in a CC list, right, um, no one's going to get angry because it's all there. Um, one of the things that we also saw was that this allowed us to implement automated checks in our DevOps um, tool. So we check for, for example, schema validity. We may introduce additional checks, making sure that it's written properly. Um, this opens up a lot of how we do policy development um, these days. And the last part is how we deploy our policy. So previously, as I mentioned, uh, when we developed security controls, it was either one big PDF file or Word document that was then emailed to the whole government and be like, hey, um, comply to this, right? And uh, 270 pages, I think, was, was the number of pages. Um, I, I heard from some of the colleagues uh, at, at NIST that they used to have something called a golden CD or something. Um, that was for the 1,200 controls, right? It doesn't make sense. 
Now with um, Git and our workflows, DevOps workflows, we have stuff like deploy artifacts, we have versioning, we have Git diffs, right? So that when a new version of our policy comes out, our users in the whole government, such as agencies and system owners, can now refer to a diff and be like, oh, this exact word changed here. And this is the person who changed it. If I'm not happy, I can email that person. And this is why they changed it, because it's all recorded in issues and pull requests. The second thing is that um, you know we now have version tagging. So for example, a lot of agencies, one of the things that we found out was that you know they're not exactly weighted with bated breath for the uh, next version of a security control. Um, the more likely scenario is that they wait till an audit is coming and they'd be like, okay, let's actually look at what changed since the last audit so we know what we need to do, right? And so this is where our version and change logs come in very useful, which was not really present before. Um, that had to be done manually, be like, hey, this is what we changed. But now with Git, um, that allows us to actually have a view for our users to see. And this is very different from the way that we did our releases previously. Another thing uh, I'm going to expand about is the DevOps transformation that we did, right? So as you can see in the screenshot here, is uh, we used an open source tool uh, called Trestle, uh, which is an off-scale authoring um, and, and uh, modifi modification tool developed initially by IBM, but I think now it's you know, uh, open source under a different company. Um, and the way that this does is that it helps us to um, manage all of that JSON, right? One of the challenges when you move to a more machine readable is that it's kind of less human readable, right? Not everyone likes JSON. Um, and while we do have and encourage a lot of our uh, practitioners, subject matter experts to contribute to policies, um, <laughs> Not, not any, all of them want to write policy. I think they want to write code, right? Um, so we have to bring in people from other parts of governments, including traditional policymakers, um, our governance, risk and compliance people. Um, and, and these um, contributors may not be as uh, familiar or comfortable with writing JSON. So what this tool does is that it helps us simplify a lot of this. You just run the script and it converts it to Markdown, a lot more human readable. They can edit it in Markdown. And then you, when you run it again, it just converts it back to JSON. Um, as I mentioned, it helps us check for, um, uh, for schema errors, but it also helps us to generate distribution files. So it actually resolves and collapses a lot of the OSCAL models I shared with you earlier, uh, such as the catalog, the profiles, the system security plans, into a distribution version that can then be consumed by a lot of our downstream automation and um, checking platforms. So yeah, that's our make file. Um, a little something special for this. And more importantly, of course, I mentioned, we're not going to go around asking agencies to look at JSON files. So one of the things that we've changed is that now we also use these artifacts to generate preview websites. Um, we use uh, Next.js to kind of build a um, automatically generated static website that takes in the new uh, policies written in JSON and converts them into static website pages. And this means that it's extremely agile, because the way that we've done it previously was um, not continuous deployment, right? There'll be a Word document that everyone edits and at a meeting they kind of uh, confirms that this is gonna be the policy and then someone sends an email blast and hopes that everyone you know, catches that email or checks the website. Um, what we have now is that the moment a new policy change um, is merged into main, the static website is updated using continuous deploy. Um, and of course we do have versioning and so on, but this allows the latest policy to be rolled out in an incremental fashion. Um, the problem with, as mentioned, the previous waterfall approach was that um, by going through an annual policy meeting where the committee approves this huge batch of changes is that our agencies and our system users get overwhelmed, right? Um, there's so much development in the uh, technology space. For example, there may be new AI controls that get rolled out. And this goes in one big batch. So when we have 118 controls today, tomorrow there's now 200 controls. And an agency has to pass and use every single one of them. What we've gone and done is that we've revisited this approach and changed it into a more incremental approach. So for example, the team may want to add five controls today for AI, right? And then that allows our agencies and system owners to gradually onboard into new compliance regimes, policies, and standards. It also makes it a lot easier to digest. Um, 
and also makes it a lot easier for us to track how agencies are reacting to certain controls rather than releasing a hundred of them at once and then kind of hoping for the best, nothing gets set on fire. Um, now we are able to kind of release five, six, seven and track how agencies are reacting to this control and how the compliance is evolving. Um, it's not just the preview website that allows us to uh, use uh, continuous development. As mentioned, um, there are multiple consumers of our OSCAL products. So we have an OSCAL source of truth that is in a Git repository in our inner source repository in government. And now we have multiple consumers that are building on top of that. I'll give you a few examples. The first is the beta review website, which I just showed the screenshot of earlier. But now we have something called an SSP submission portal where agencies can submit their system security plans describing what controls they are now implementing uh, in, um, in OSCAL. And um, basically the portal automatically ingests the latest distribution artifact or version of the OSCAL policy and then regenerates the checks uh, needed. The second, uh, the third is the compliance checking tool. So we do have, you know, built-in tools for the cloud environments, specific CSPs that map existing controls to CSP checks. Um, again, this will be automatically updated the moment we push a new control. And then finally, we have two uh, public-facing um, um, outputs. We have the public information portal for our vendors to kind of look at the checks. Uh, again, it's another static website that is also automatically generated. And the last is our Git repository, which we hope most people refer to, but I think they prefer the public info portal. So we have two outputs for them to look at. So there are a few lessons that we learned in this journey. And I, I know, it, I think one of the challenges we had was really that uh, how do we evolve our governance teams, right, to start thinking about it? There are two ways to think about it, right? You can make developers work, act more like policymakers, or you can kind of tell the policymakers, if you're going to write policies for technology, then maybe you should be good at technology, right? <laughs> and so I have run Git workshops and JSON workshops for our policymakers being like, hey, here's how you make a push request, right? And, and I think this is kind of the bridging that was really important as part of our workflow where we upgrade um, our governance teams, our policy teams, to be actually familiar with the technology that they are governing, right? Um, and also helping them you have the tools they need to succeed. So for example, I mentioned we use Trestle to make it easier to author in Markdown instead of JSON. Um, but we also add checks, tools, um, a lot of the CI, CD uh, actions that we've written to make it easier for them to figure out if they've written correct or scale or not. Um, the second thing is how users approach um, certain uh, policies and goals, right? Um, they have very different approaches. Some of them just want to comply and forget about it, and no one bothers them. Some of them are, you know, developers who are very, very agitated when a specific control seems to be, you know, out of out, uh, out of sync. I'll give you one in, in, uh, interesting edge case, right? Um, which was a password control. So password complexity, password length is a very common security controls in many standards. And in this case, I think our education ministry was very agitated about it. They were like, hey, we don't like having 12 characters in your password. And I was like, why? Uh, <laughs> and they're like, our kids hate it, right? Because five and six year olds and seven year olds, their hands are small. They can't reach across the keyboard, right? They can't use complex characters and they forget their password and they, they cry about it, right? Um, and you know, when you work in government, I think that's the amazing thing of working in government is that you kind of deal with all kinds of edge cases that you see across Singapore, right? And that made sense to us. So what we did, and this is a really cool thing about OSCAL, is that we parameterized the number of characters, right? So this became a editable field that if an agency, for example, the education ministry, developing a specific system for like, I don't know, five, six years old, seven year olds, um, they can actually uh, select this um, number of characters, change it, and just submit their system security plan. So we are really moving away from a pure compliance-based approach towards a more risk-based, you know, user-based, um, forward-facing, um, tell us what you need, right, and assess your risk by yourself and move it to you. But as I mentioned, this is a problem because it involves not just upgrading the skills of our policy developers, our system owners, but also, I think, changing mindsets. Uh, moving from a compliance-based approach where, hey, I tick all these boxes, if something goes wrong, it's your fault, you know, I did the best, towards being like, hey, I think you need to be a bit more skilled in deciding what risks your system pose, uh, accepts and what risks you want to 
uh, mitigate, right? And this is really part of the journey. Uh, I think as an engineer, right, is kind of something that looks good on paper. But one thing I think in the past year in our journey and our learning points was that how much we have to bring people along with us, right? The government can't just move because a few uh, engineers felt very angry about something and uh, changed something. Uh, and so what we've done is we have done trainings. We have you know, started to upgrade the skills of our policy makers, developers, and not just that, our management, right? Because um, I think now our management may be risk averse, they may be risk forward, but it's all about putting them on the same page. I think one of the other interesting stories uh, we have from this journey is just uh, moving from a process-based set of controls towards a more action-based set of controls. And what do I mean by that? Uh, we used to have a lot of controls that meant uh, that said stuff like, have a process uh, for backups, uh, right? And so uh, document a process where you do backups. And what we did was that we changed a lot of these controls to now do backups, right? Because I think we are all, I think one of the things that our compliance uh, approach was, was that we are very, uh, big on documentation, on artifacts, which is important, um, but it doesn't actually equate to the action that we want to take, which is actually do your backups, right? And that looks very different from the machine-readable perspective, because from the machine's perspective, yes, I can have an S3 bucket where you upload your backup plan, and we know that a backup plan exists, but if you think about your cloud environments that will check your cloud configurations, they can tell exactly how often you run a backup, uh, the size of the backup, and, and you know, the latest recovery point. Right? And it, so it makes a lot more sense to change that control into something that's actionable with important audit and uh, provenance artifacts. And you know, it feeds into S-bombs and stuff like that. But I think that's a much bigger journey that we have to do. So if you're um, interested uh, in where we're going to next, I think one of the big things is the platforms that we're trying to build. Um, we have built the content, right? But it's about the platforms. How do we get more of our tools to be compatible with OSCAL, to be compatible with automated checks, uh, to ingest, for example, an SBOM or a system security plan, and be able to automatically check the uh, decomposed uh, components of a system for compliance instead. And that involves you know, a lot of collaboration and sharing. So I think uh, for those of the compliance folks, you may know that OSCAL is a tool that's first came out from the U.S. National Institutes of Standards, which they currently use for their SB 853 set of controls and FedRAM. Um, but it's been adopted, and actually other countries are now using it. Australia is using it. Um, and one of, these things, one of the great things about this is that it allows us to share, allows us to contribute back to the standard, and finally, you know, I think, evolve across a standard set of controls. Uh, one of the points from the previous talk was just that, you know, everyone has their own standard, and when they find a standard they don't like, they go and create their own standards, so now we have like 50 standards uh, across the government. And what we're trying to do is gradually converge on a common set of catalogs, and uh, you see that in the way that we map to other controls. But honestly, why shouldn't we use a control from SB 853 if it says the exact same thing? Um, and so a lot of this has to go into a, a common Esperanto, a common format, um, before we're able to move towards this gradual convergence. And that is kind of one of the ideas and hopes that we have for this project. So right now we have two outputs that are uh, open to the public. We have a GitHub repository that shows you how the OSCAL uh, JSON representation of our controls looks like. Um, we also do have an information portal that gives you a, a vendors, for example, a more user-friendly view of how we do security controls um, and uh, basically look at the controls that they want to implement. And if you have a problem with any of them, open a pull request. I'd be very happy to kind of take any comments or suggestions. And that's the great thing, right, about putting DevOps uh, in place. Cool. So I think that's uh, the talk, but I think we wanted to reserve some time for Q&A. Any questions? Have you been uh, looking into the uh, impact of um, these new workloads around large language models and uh, any initial uh, perceptions around that topic? Because some people seem to think that they're, oh, just another workload in IT. Other people feel that, you no, know, they're unique and represent a new class of compliance challenges. 
Yeah, I, I mean, Is I, I, I come from the offensive security domain, right? So I'm a pen tester, and 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 so I, I kind of see it as like another input output, you know, um, set of controls. Um, obviously, um, there's a lot of excitement around it in government. You know, something new to regulate, something new to write policies for. Um, I, I think. The way that we are seeing it right now is that we are kind of not trying to put anything into our security catalog uh, so soon. I, I, I don't think you'll see it, any of the controls right now. But there's a lot of public information about what the Singapore government has done. They have released playbooks, guidance. They're still trying to figure it a way around. So I think that we are not really a regulation first kind of approach, but we're trying to get a sense of the, um, the way it's going. Oh, sorry, the question? Okay, I have a question. Um, in the open source contribution project for the security part, uh, do you require to set up the security policy in the GitHub? Yes, yeah. So I think it's an interesting um, challenge, right? Because that means that if you want to contribute to this uh, security controls, you have to make a Git uh, commit, for example. Um, Initially, it was kind of like a filtering mechanism. It's like, hey, if you can't push on Git, should you be writing a control uh, for, for technology? Um, but then we realized, like, you know, that's not really nice or fair, and people get angry when we say that. Um, so what we did was start to have your workshops, right? But I think it's all part of this upskilling um, thing that we're trying to do across government, right? Because for our technology folks, uh, policy folks, we want them to be conservative in Git. And do you require to turn on this dependent about? Uh, depend upon you yes said? um so i mean we we do have uh depend upon for like our standard checks in cicd making sure that trust is updated for example yeah uh, so it will list all the dependencies license and the vulnerabilities issues not only for the, the first layers of source code but all dependencies Ah, I see what you mean. Yeah, so um, it's interesting, right? Because the system security plan is supposed to describe the components in the system. Um, for example, what databases they have, uh, you know, whether they have uh, syst uh, specific uh, resources. Um, but it doesn't map as neatly to SBOMs right now. I think there are some projects that are trying to map SBOMs uh, dependency list to a system security plan, but it's not perfect. So I think that's part of the evolution of this um, policy. Mm. The last question is, do you require the project owner fulfill the open SSFs? Um, best practice and do require the project owner to run in the open source SF's uh, scorecard? Um, not yet, I think. Uh, we have a very generic uh, control for dependency management. Um, you can see it in the uh, Git repo, uh, the, uh, the control for uh, dependency management. Um, but I think one of the things that we want to do is have that flexibility for the whole government, uh, depending on how they build, um, to choose which tools they want to use. Thank you. And um, a previous individual asked some of the some of what I was uh, intending to ask, but just kind of one one kind of follow up on that. So on the very interested in the training piece because you know um, I'm sure m m many of the people sitting in here work for institutions that have people with different levels of willingness to learn, yeah. e even if it's not so difficult to do a git add git commit. In principle, in practice, it, it, it can be it can be a, a matter of pure stubbornness. So, so I'm curious: uh, it, to what degree is contributing in this manner now mandatory in the Singapore government versus uh, your kind of more traditional, like some of the, the the methodologies that you were you were kind of like you know the the Word docs and Excel docs back and forth. Yeah, um, so that's a really good point. Um, so I, I want to emphasize as well that you know this journey is really you need management buy-in to kind of support the way that we do things, bring in more practitioners to get more sensible controls. Um, the fact is that our source of truth we have agreed upon is the Git repository. So if you want to make a change to a policy, uh, whether you are a governance person, a cybersecurity person, you have to make a Git re a re a request. And what we have seen is that they've been graduating gra uh, different levels, right? So for example, our security uh, cybersecurity uh, group within uh, GovTech um, is pretty conversant, and I was like, hey, uh, you guys want to edit the pen test control, make this request here, and they just kind of 
did their own thing, they didn't ask me any questions, then they went and did it. Uh, but then the governance team, for example, you know, may be less familiar with Git. Um, and what they have done is that they've actually you know, started training their own people to be familiar with Git. Um, and we have been quite firm on that. Um, so I think part of that, um, I'm not sure how much this will evolve. You know, I think as time goes by, more people may complain or not. Um, but what we've seen so far is that I think more people are growing on board. And part of this is really them understanding OSCAL understanding what they did. So they've met with NIST, they've kind of understand why it exists. Um, but I do have this conversation very regularly where I introduce it to a new partner who wants to contribute and they're like, why is it, what's this? You know, um, and I think part of it is just being very clear about your standards. When, um, when having sort of policymakers make changes to these um, policies, do you have any mechanisms for um, I guess identifying the impact of a change uh, preemptively, because uh, I guess there are some changes that could quite immediately put people out of compliance at quite a scale. So you have a way of calculating that um, before those are actually committed. Yeah, so that's a really good point. Um, so one of the things that we do is that we have a template system security plan where we tie a generic component, for example, we say a database, uh, to the control. So what we're hoping, we haven't actually done this yet, um, is that as more agencies submit their system security plans, we will understand the impact a single control uh, has on the rest of government, how many actual components, not just systems, are affected by a change in this control. Um, I think a lot of it also is tied with um, how we do the automated checks. Um, so. I mean, it's not super open source, but you know, we have AWS config checks, right, that are tied to a specific control. Um, and this actually runs across whole of government. Um, so we are able to actually test, potentially, ahead of time, if we change this parameter, how will that picture change across the whole of government in the AWS CSPs, for example. So it's really dependent on the control and which system uh, components uh, use that control. But yeah, cool idea. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for the uh, talk. And uh, so, like, uh, Japanese government also like have some committee uh, pre prepared to publish the final document on the GitHub and uh, ask for uh, comments, like the uh, same as uh, the SG policy as well. But like, uh, I, we found that the number of comments received, is, especially from the the individuals, I mean, like non-government officials, like uh, citizens or whatever, whatever industries or tech tech uh, communities are slightly so, uh, lower than like uh, uh, compared to traditional way. Uh, I think because of that, um, might be difficult to use a like, GitHub for those people. But like, uh, but uh, like we. Uh, the Japanese government tried to do some sort of stuff, but uh, like, it's those movement is very very slowly, and uh, and adoption is not also like very low. So, do you have any like for Singapore government? Do you have uh, has any plan to onboard like, migrate from traditional um, processes to like newer like the processes like to for the other standards or policies uh, and also like a. It, it'd be great if I, if we could get the answer like how to involve the as you mentioned like there's a workshop but like how do we involve the non-technical people uh, allowing that with uh, like our like technical like engineer way. Yeah, I mean it's a transform transformation journey, right? I, I think the way that we see it is that it's critical um, to the evolution of technology, um, the way that we do government technology. Uh, one thing I think that has been very helpful for us is identifying people who, the big groups of people who actually care, right? And that's two groups, right? Firstly, is the users of the policy. Um, so for example, when we are expanding into a new set of policies that maybe govern on-premises systems, right? We kind of do a survey uh, across all the systems you have in government, figure out which agency or ministry might have a lot of on-premises systems. And then we reach out to them proactively and say, hey, you guys are going to be the most affected by this change. Um, maybe you want to take a look at this. The other set of groups is uh, vendors, right? Uh, because vendors have to build systems for us. Um, and one of the things uh, that we found, actually, is that, unfortunately, I think for vendors, um, one of the biggest changes that we emerged from, as I mentioned, was that it was not previously public. So we come from different starting points. Uh, and now that it's public, um, what we have done is that we have also, again, proactively 
engage them. So we have organized uh, vendor outreach sessions where we bring them in a room and be like, hey, there's this new thing, make sure you know about it. Um, so, so a lot of it is really very physical, uh, I would say. Um, uh, we haven't really had a lot of organic growth as much as we like. Uh, what we have seen is that most of the time it's the developers, as you mentioned, or students who are much more forward, who would then comment or create an issue and merge request. So we have combined that with physical outreach efforts, workshops, as I mentioned, um, uh, vendor engagement sessions um, to really just bring the feedback in. Uh, what I would say is that the authoring is very good, but the feedback and all that, we still keep all the channels open as much as possible. Okay, time is up. Thank you. Thank you.